three, two, one, integrate. This, this is the MIT Integration B 2023 finals problem number one. Competitors have four minutes to solve it. It took me four days. This was a beast. After thinking about it for some time, it occurred to me, four minutes, there's gotta be a better way. And then it occurred to me, there is. And all we need to do is take a slice of pie in the complex plane. This is a story of complex contour integration. This is the integral from zero to pi over two of the cube root of tangent, all divided by sine x plus cosine x squared. Can you solve it? This integral required many, many substitutions and involved many, many integrals. Here's the short version. Two pi squared of three all over nine. But in four minutes, that's not the way we're going to do it. So we're going to employ the use of complex numbers. By making a substitution here of t equals tan of x, we reduce the integral down to the integral from zero to infinity of t to the one third power over t plus one squared. And with another substitution by letting t equal x squared, this becomes the integral from zero to infinity of two x to the five thirds power over x squared plus one quantity squared dx. You'll see why in a minute that this integral is much more preferable to use when working in the complex plane. So we take our function, the integrand, and replace x with the complex variable z. And you'll notice that the denominator factors nicely into z plus i squared and z minus i squared. This allows us to find what are called the poles of the function, singularities, places where the function blows up. Now these poles are important because they will allow us to do something very different in the complex plane from the real plane. You see, if we take one of these poles like I and enclose it with a contour, a closed contour here, we'll take a slice of pi as our contour. It is composed of three separate lines or curves, gamma r, psi of t, and L1, traversed in a counterclockwise manner. The pole I, which is a second order pole, is enclosed in this closed contour. And so we can apply Cauchy's residue theorem, which says that the closed contour of this function integrated is going to equal two pi I times the sum of the residues of the poles inside. This will also be equal to what each of the contour integral or line integrals along each curve will evaluate to. So here, we'll start with the function f of z, and we'll leave the denominator in its factored form. 
And since our pole here is I, we're going to calculate the residue here by doing something quite interesting. So before we begin, let's take a journey through how I got there to f of z. So to see how the whole substitution took place, I'm going to take you through it. t equals the tan of x, so therefore dt equals the secant squared of x dx. And rewriting secant squared as 1 over cosine squared x and bring that to the other side of the equation, we can begin to formulate some ideas about how to simplify this integrand. Looking at the triangle with angle x and using the tangent equal to t to set this triangle up, we find its hypotenuse, and therefore we can write the cosine squared as 1 over t squared plus 1. So replacing that in our differential, we can get a nicer integrand. Also, we notice that the denominator sine x plus cosine squared is going to factor out to 1 plus 2 sine x cosine x. And when we've expanded that, 2 sine x cosine x can also be evaluated in terms of t using that triangle. So now we can replace this integral with the integral from 0 to infinity of t cubed over 1 plus 2t over t squared plus 1 multiplied by 1 over t squared plus 1 dt. And when you multiply through the denominator and simplify that, you get a denominator of t squared plus 2t plus 1, which also factors nicely into t plus 1 squared. Now, if I had used this integrand and went right into the complex plane, it would be a little more difficult because the pole would lie on the real axis. So rather, we're going to make another substitution here and let t equal x squared. dt would then be 2x dx. And substituting into the integrand and doing some algebraic manipulation with the exponents, we get 2x to the 5 thirds over x squared plus 1 quantity squared dx. And at first glance, it may seem like the integrand that we created here is more complicated, but when we move into the complex plane, it'll be preferable. So now, changing the variable from x to z, z being a complex number, this integral is going to become a closed contour integral, which you see we use the notation with a little circle around the integral and the letter C indicating the closed contour. We replace x with z, and we look at where the poles, or the singularities, of the integrand function will be. We are going to take a closed contour that encloses one or more of the poles. In this case, we're going to enclose just the pole z equals i. And because of that, we will then use the residue theorem to evaluate what that closed contour integral is equal to. Cauchy's Residue Theorem. Cauchy's Residue Theorem states that the closed contour of f of z dz around a particular pole is equal to 2 pi i times the sum of the residues of all the poles that it would enclose. For our case, we only have one pole, but it could enclose several poles. And so we would find the residue of each and add them up. 2 pi i times that would give us the contour integral. And we want to choose a closed contour here so that when we evaluate the left-hand side of the integral, we can actually do the line integrals and evaluate them with ease. Once we have the two sides of the equation, we can equate them and solve the integral. Here we note that f of z has second order poles at z equals plus or minus i. That is because the factor is raised to a power of 2. So we will have to choose a clever contour that only surrounds one of those poles, like I said, z equals i. And when we calculate the residue for that pole, we will have to employ a little calculus to do so. 
Now graphing the imaginary plane here and plotting the pole I, the first contour here will be along the real axis, which will represent the integral that we're really interested in from zero to infinity, but here we'll just start from zero to R. And then we'll consider a semicircular arc starting at the X axis and moving through an angle phi, and we'll call that curve capital gamma R, R for the radius of that curve. And finally, we will return back to where we started through a straight line in the complex plane given by the curve psi of T. Now for L1 along the real axis, the limit as R goes to infinity of our integral from zero to R is the integral that we're interested in calculating. The curve around gamma R will be parametrized by Z equals R e to the I phi and DZ would then be equal to I R e to the I phi D phi. Then we plug these values into our complex valued function. And using some exponent rules, we can simplify the integrand. Now I'm not going to take you through the entire calculation here, but as we set up the integral here, now using the polar representation, we can then make the argument that as R goes to infinity, the integrand itself will go to zero. And this argument can be made using some absolute value arguments, namely something that is tied into the triangle inequality. The absolute value of this integral will approach zero. And so therefore the contribution coming from gamma will not be any contribution at all, it'll just be zero. So finally we have to think about the contribution coming from psi, which is parametrized by the letter t. So if we let z equal t e to the i phi, then as t runs from r to zero, it'll traverse that line in, in the way that you would naturally think. So we can set up the integral from r to zero of this parametrization, and we can again simplify it using some of the rules of exponents. Now here, we have an integral where we can flip the bounds of integration and just pull out a negative sign. So then we can get it to go from zero to R. You see, ultimately we wanna take the limit as N R goes to infinity, and that'll give us something that looks like the original integral we're trying to get, which namely we called I in this problem. And then we can relate that to the other contours that we calculated. So here, as I go through and I work out the details of the exponentials, we get a constant to get pulled out of this integral here, a constant which e to the i phi over three with that negative sign will play a major role in our solution. So now here at this point in the integration, we choose a phi so that we get that e to the two i phi inside there to be equal to one. So now that our whole integral looks like the real integral that we're trying to evaluate. So now pulling that constant out, applying phi equals pi into our formula, we see that we can extract a constant multiplied by our original integral as the limit of r going to infinity. And e to the eight pi i over three can actually be simplified down to e to the two pi i over three because of periodicity. So we can now put the solutions of our problem on at least one side of the equal sign together. So our complete contour C consists of the line integrals along gamma, psi, and L1. And now plugging in the values that we found here, we see that we can do a nice little job of factoring out the original integral i that we're looking to calculate. And so now we have a constant times that multiple of i, and that's going to serve us well. Now all we have to do is find two pi i times the residue of this function at evaluated at our pole i. Now you don't 
encounter residues in real number calculus, but you do encounter them in complex numbered calculus. And here we have something called a second order pole, having something to do with the exponent on the factor in the denominator. So that requires us to take the derivative of f of z, but not just f of z, the limit as z goes to this pole of f of z multiplied by the factor that would cause the singularity at that pole, meaning z minus i squared. If I had plugged in i, the denominator would blow up. So we have a new function here within the derivative that we have to take and then evaluate at the pole i. So really, I'm just looking at taking the derivative using the product or quotient rule, however you like to look at it. And then I'm going to plug in, as like I would take a limit, plug in i into z. Now, I haven't really gone into detail as to why I took the derivative of that function, and that's all a part of uh, Cauchy's residue theorem. So maybe I'll make a video on that entire process at another time. But here I'm evaluating I and using some exponent exponential rules to simplify. And there's a couple of nice things that happen in the world of complex numbers. When you keep taking repeated powers of a certain number, you start cycling back to the same number. So we have some simplification here and ultimately it comes down to our residue is going to be equal to negative one thirds e raised to the i pi over three. So that is our residue and we're gonna have to multiply this by two pi i and that'll be the right hand side of our integral equation that we're trying to solve. So before we found the contour integrals gave us this constant times our integral i that we're after. And on the right hand side, we have basically complex constants. But if we play around with these complex constants a little, we can get some nice things to happen. So if I multiply both sides of the equation by negative e to the raised to the negative i pi over three, I will get that other side, the right side, the negative e to the i pi over three to cancel. And then why would I do something like that? Well. For here, on the left-hand side, when I factor or multiply through, something emerges, a familiar form. If you are familiar with the exponential form of the sine function, if I divide both sides of this equation by 2i, I get rid of it on the right, and I can rewrite this as the sine of pi over 3 times i equals pi over 3. And the sine of pi over three is radical three over two as an exact value. So then I can divide both sides by the reciprocal, or multiply by the reciprocal, I should say. And then I'll get i is equal to pi over three times two over radical three, which we can rewrite that as i is equal to two pi over three radical three, or rationalizing the denominator, two pi radical three all over nine. And that is the value of our MIT Integration B 2023 finals number one. And the answer is also equal to something related to the gamma function. A very interesting problem. And all it took was a slice of pie in the complex plane. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell for more videos, and stay tuned for the next one. Thanks.